I am here today to lead a roundtable discussion, really just to find out more uh, what kind of challenges you guys are going through, what kind of assistance you need, uh, how we can better work together to improve our industry and help small processors and meat producers thrive. Um, so I don't have to take notes. I decided because I have a video camera here with me already, I'm just gonna try to uh, record this session. And I'm also doing short processor interviews out in the hallway afterwards because NPAN has a YouTube channel and we're putting together a series for our YouTube channel on uh, just small processor stories. So if you could come talk to me afterwards and uh, be willing to answer a few questions on video um, and then we'll put it up on YouTube. And it's really just a way for uh, other processors and others in the meat industry to know you know, what, what your life is like and um, better support your business. So that's what NPAN is. How many people in this room are a member of the NPAN listserv? Raise your hand. So there's a few. More of you need to sign up. It's all free, it's part of Extension. Everything we do is free, so uh, make sure you get on that listserv. Um, so the, how I wanted to start this out, it, pretty big room, lots of people here, but I wanted to go around the room and just say your name and what your operation looks like. Uh, what do you do? What kind of animals do you process? Are you inspected? Are you custom? Are you doing slaughter? Are you doing further processing, co-packing for farmers, etc.? So I'll just pass the mic and we'll go this way. Howard Elmer, Pigtail Pork, Cove, Oregon, process pork only, custom exam. Uh, Nels Youngberg, Mountain Springs Poultry, um, out of Willow, Ohio, Oregon. Um, it's the U.S. exam, 20,000 birds or less. Davina Youngberg, Mineral Springs Poultry. Preston Youngboat, Mineral Springs Poultry. Tracy Smotches, Heritage Meats, Rochester, Washington, USDA Slaughter, USDA Processing, Custom Exempt, Retail, Wholesale, just about it. And I've cut up just about anything anyone would want to try to eat, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adam Olson, Olson's Meats, um, uh, Custom Exempt, Retail, and Game Processing. Scott Shelton, Mom's Cut Meats in Ellensburg, Washington. Uh, we're custom exempt. We have a food processing plant license. We do uh, wild game and uh, specialty meats. I'm the other half of the crew. <laughs> For an animal, animal uh, meat company, we're a custom slaughter, custom processing, retail meats. I'm Kathy Apple. I'm with him. <laughs> Lower Valley Beats, Kalispell, Montana. Mike Hicks. Uh, I'll do what you tell me to do. <laughs> yeah, no, it's Wes Plummer from Lower Valley Processing in Kalispell. It's uh, over in Montana. We are a, a, a state inspected plant, uh, and all these new rules and regulations over here. You know, we're in our own little world over there. <laughs> but we slaughter. We do. We just slaughtered 140 buffalo here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we're getting ready in July is our emu month. You know, we slaughter emus three days a week in July, plus our regular slaughter day. And then we do lots of elk and buffalo too, with the inspection and stuff for the park service. And we, Mike is our cure man. He does doing an awesome job on our curing and Plus, we've got a bunch of sausage products, and, but our sausage man is fishing here. We, we do it all. So. Jim Waringa uh, from Island Grown Farmers Cooperative. Uh, we, ran, we run a USDA mobile, and we do uh, mostly USDA processing, some custom, and certified organic processing as well. No curing or smoking, typically beef, pork, lamb, and goat. Uh, we slaughter mostly lamb. That's what Pat Paris, Del Fox Meats, and Stanwood process uh, mostly custom example. We do the 
USDA custom slaughtering, custom USDA processing, and all wholesale retail exemption, lots of small beef carrying and lots and lots of beef prices. Shelly with Dean's Distributing, and we are a supplier of like boxed beef for some local meat shops and grocery store chains. Uh, Beef Roy, Super One Foods, retail grocery, uh, just getting into some of the smoked meats and whatnot in store. Carrie Frost, Ad Hill Meat Company, Middleton, Oregon. She's going to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> David Frost, Ad uh, Oregon, Hill Meat Company. We're a USDA inspected processor of pork. Uh, Connie Marcian, uh, I'm a student at the University of Idaho and I work for Vandalden. Uh, Isaac Riley, a uh, student employee at uh, Vandenberg Meats at the University of Idaho. I'm Kyle Noon. I uh, own uh, Panhandle Custom Meats, just a one man, one me and my wife. Uh, I raise pork, sell it. Uh, we also do wild game. Thank you. Uh, Justin Follett from Follett Smoked Meats in Hermiston, or Follett Meat Company, just change the name a little bit. Um, we do custom meat uh, wild game, and uh, an assortment of other things. Brian Dolby, HK Meats. We do uh, custom processing and retail exempt. Tanya Dolby, I'm with him. And we're in Jefferson, Oregon. Kyle Heine, I work for Eastern Oregon Mobile Slard out of Hermiston, Oregon. Gary Mount with EOMS, Eastern Oregon Mobile Slard, retired. <laughs> Michael Alger with Willamina Meat Service. Uh, we do beef, pork, lamb, and it's all custom. Uh, we're also doing processing. Dennis Lewis, White's Country Meats, Gresham, Oregon. Uh, we do a little, little retail. I'm with them. Brandy Fagner, White's Country Meats, small retail. A little bit of game, a little bit of anything you can make money on. Really? <laughs> Sell it off. <laughs> sure or not. <laughs> Jake Hines, uh, Hines Meat Company. We do custom slaughter, processing, um, wild game, retail, smoking, curing, whatever we can. The Grand Oregon. Tons, Carol, Carol Meats. Jerome Idaho, custom exempt. We do beef, pork, lamb, wild game, and have a small retail store. A little bit of catering on the side, too. Tyler Jones, uh, Scare Meats. <coughs> Josh Murray, the uh, Idaho. Austin Piconi, uh, Walwood Root Pasture Farm in Sandy, Oregon. Uh, we raise heritage uh, pastured pork and grass fed lamb, and opening a retail shop in Portland. Uh, Jeff Mayer, Mayor's Custom Meats in Vancouver, Washington, we do custom processing for the retail. Madeliskum Blue Mountain Community College from Pendleton, Oregon. We've got a little program starting up that we'll be talking more about tomorrow, so I don't want to use my three minutes up right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mike McKee, Mike's Meats and Seafood in Wenatchee, uh, retail and catering. I'm Kelly Brockle, Outlaw Meats, La Crosse, Washington. I'm speaking for him, he doesn't speak. And we do custom slaughter, custom processing in the heart of Whitman County. She doesn't speak either. <laughs> James Soto is Assistant Meat Lab Manager at University of Idaho. Michael Tully, Faculty, University of Idaho. Ken Broughton with Farm to Market Pork out of Kalispell, Montana. Uh, we do inspect the slaughter, um, processing, raise all our own animals, and sell meat to all the farm there. Chris Jody with Matt's Meat in Livingston, Montana. Just with Matt. <laughs> Jordan Roberts, Matt's Meats. Marsha Olson, Olson Meats, and Ian <laughs> Amber Olson, Olson Team. Kitty LD, Olson Team. Caitlin Yorkman, Olson Team. Caitlin Hoagie, uh, 
think it's meets in Spokane, Washington, where uh, wholesale, retail, uh, food service, USDA, where it'll kill. So it's just processing. I'm with him, and I do whatever he tells me to do. <laughs> Larry Jacob Smullen, Jacob Smullen's LLC and Canoes are going to do a fixed plant slaughter, mobile, retail, wild game, and sausage. Chris Myers uh, from Corfini, we're in Washington and Oregon. We're USDA further processors and we do food service and wholesale. Bryce Stutzman, Bogat Meats, Hubbard, Oregon. President Coolidge once said, I never got in trouble for something I did not say. <laughs> <laughs> we do uh, custom exam processing, wild game meat, we have a retail store and some uh, USDA processing. Heather Trostclair, Mountain View Custom Meats, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, welcome to Coeur d'Alene. I'm the voice of Mountain View, if you call. I'm Kevin Trostclair, uh, Mountain View Custom Meats. We do custom exempt, we do uh, slaughter on site, as well as retail, uh, and also wild game. Again, welcome to Coeur d'Alene. Are we no less? <laughs> Dave Murray, Murray's Meats, uh, custom processing. Uh, Chris Murray, I'm with him. Wow, good job, you guys. I think so uh, about a year ago, we were sell selling about 80,000 pounds of bacon a week. We are now, we hit a record, I think two weeks ago, of 350,000 pounds wow. a week. So we've expanded, we're growing. If that's what brings us to work. Paleo diet, yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's our growth, is bacon. Bacon, we do ham, bacon, sausage, but bacon's our big seller. Awesome. Anyone else? There you go. All right, Tracy. Uh, <laughs> I, I recently um, just got label approval for a fresh ham. Um, with natural cooking nitrites. So for all the direct marketers in my area that are producing pork, um, the, one of the most difficult things is actually getting your hams and bacon smoked under USDA inspection. So I created this new program called uh, Cold Cured. Um, essentially, I take the hams, uh, cut them into three to four pound rows, I tumble them, and under my passive plan, I was able to get a label approval and now I'm able to produce a ham roast for folks out of fresh product, product, which will greatly assist everyone's ability to sell their pork. That's nitrate free or naturally occurring. Yep. That's awesome. Anyone else have something exciting to share? Well, I don't know if it's exciting, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I got into this, I had a 15 year career in, in pipe fitting and I got back into cutting meat because I think there's a resurgence in people wanting to know where their cut their meat's cut and where it comes from and they're getting tired of the box stores and not knowing where their meat's coming from um, and what's in their meat so that's another thing and the other thing like you said is what I'm finding in this area up here is most people want naturally cured stuff without nitrates and nitrates so I might be talking to you after because <laughs> I'm just getting started, but I've had a huge demand in everybody asking for nitrate-free bacon and hams. And so I need to learn a lot more. <laughs> Anything else that people are excited about? I guess the one thing that um, excites me the most, because I work with the customers, is our customers, because they're so excited to get the fresh meat and to know where it came from and just to come in and visit with without our customers we wouldn't be here Are you excited about it? oh yeah i'm excited <laughs> to still be alive <laughs> but i'm retired <laughs> you're excited about being retired Absolutely. well i'm excited that you have a younger person taking over your business well i have him and uh, my son-in-law and daughter and uh, they're doing a fabulous job Anyone else ha have something cool to share or something that you're excited about? 
we're a little bit of a different dynamic than most. Uh, we're a farmers cooperative, so um, this started off back in. Well, I started the company in 2002, but they started five years previous, just to form. They saw a lot of the custom guys out there, but what they wanted was the same model of a mobile with the USDA uh, bug, so they can sell that product direct to the consumer. Um, so I've just seen a lot of uh, new members coming onto the co-op, and what it is is really sustainable farming and all of that, just to get the family farms to be able to be pr uh, productive and uh, sell that product direct to, to make the money to keep going. So it's just real exciting to see that, and, um, see that co-op grow. We're probably pretty close to about 80 members, uh, 80 different uh, co-op members, not all our growers, um, they, they've joined probably to you know, help the co-op out, but uh, yeah, just interesting to see the growth in that, and, uh, and that USD Mobile has also kind of expanded quite a bit. We were the first USD Mobile truck, and I think there's probably about 20 to 25 units that have been built, and they've gone not only US, but they've gone all over the country, uh, Chile and Brazil and Africa, it's just amazing to see what's all happened in this, so it's just been exciting. Yeah, and uh, the founder of the co-op, Bruce Dunlop, he's on our advisory board, so uh, we get to hear a lot about your cooperative, and it's certainly a model for, for the rest of the country and even the world, so it's great. Is anything else that people are excited about before we go into the not-so-exciting stuff? Uh, just uh, looking around the room, seeing all the people who showed up, it's really nice to see it. Uh, the number of vendors also and don't don't forget to talk to these people and thank them for showing up and and getting their products out there to where we can use them and utilize them to our you know best interests and uh, also don't forget to thank your board members for all the uh, effort that they put into you know organizing things and, and whatnot yes just as Meat producers can't survive without processors. Processors can't survive without the equipment suppliers and package dealers and all of those things. So it's great to see them all here. So my next question is sort of the flip side of the excitement one. What, what are some issues for you that are keeping you awake at night? What, what, what are some of your biggest challenges right now? Who wants to go first? Come on. I know. I know there's some things. <laughs> Labor retention training and recruiting is part of the biggest challenge we see right now. So if you've got any ideas. ideas. Yeah. We have some a gentleman here who works on labor. Yeah, my name is Brian Smith and I'm a managing consultant for Mineral Springs Poultry. One of the things we've done to help with retention or recruitment is we've looked at some state programs, some re-entry programs for people who are recent offenders. And one, they're motivated, which is one of our biggest issues. Talent or help that's motivated. Two, there's a significant tax advantage to my client's company in terms of enlisting the services of these motivated individuals. The, and as long as you get the paperwork from the state, in our case, Oregon, before you hire them and fill it out, you're looking at anywhere from a few percent to significant tax dollars, depending on the size of your organization. Second thing we've done is we've partnered with the state of Oregon in terms of the young lady's name is Megan Billiard. She works in the Salem office and her job is to help find us qualified help. We've given her our job descriptions and our requirements. She feeds them into the state database and then she does a direct outreach to individuals based on their skill sets, their qualifications, and their needs. So these are two avenues that we've used. Third Avenue we've used is Goodwill Resources. The uh, Goodwill is a really good source 
for recruiting in your area because they have a job right now. Yes, depending on what it is you want people to do, there can be some challenges there. But again, if you're trying to get your brand name out there, which is one of the things that my company specializes in on behalf of Mineral Springs Poultry, getting your brand name out there by going through Goodwill Services or the state of Oregon, it's free advertising, folks. It's free marketing. And people know other people. So if you're looking for resources, at least in Oregon, those are three areas I highly recommend, especially even looking at people who are recent offenders and exiting or transitioning out of the Department of Corrections. Because let's face it, it's all about a buck and your bottom line. And if you can hire somebody who's motivated and get tax breaks for it too, I say it's a win-win for everybody. That's just my take. That's great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Tracy, you want to talk about labor? Oh, <laughs> I can't find it. I probably <laughs> currently employ five felons. Um, some of my best employees are felons. Um, they're a lot. They're a lot of fun too. But. Other than that, um, uh, the, the, one of our biggest challenges is really because of the felons, they can't use weapons and they can't, um, so that breaks, they have a difficult time getting them on the slaughter floor. Even if we are running an encapsulated stunner, they're worried about whether or not they can work with that. They're apprehensive. Um, the other issue is just what I've seen through the years, and some that grew up in the industry, like many folks here, is that people have lost the identity of what it's what it's like to really work hard. And so yeah. I get a lot of guys that'll come in and they look at me like, this is really hard. I go, yes, it is really hard to cut me. I mean, you are gonna have to stand in concrete. So it's, um, there's some folks that are coming back and wanting to do it, but the, the, we're still, there's not enough. And that's one of the biggest challenges that, I, that, that we face. And I think the Blue Mountain College gentleman is going to be talking about some training programs tomorrow. Uh, NPAN, the organization I work for, has two webinars coming up in May and June about uh, finding and keeping good employees. So it's a two-part series, and our webinars are always free. And then we also record them and put them on our YouTube channel. So if you can't be present during the webinar itself, you can always watch it later. So uh, come up to me later and I'll tell you how to get more information about that. Any other things keeping people awake at night? Other challenges that people want to share? Well, you said that North Idaho, Co or North Idaho College is going to talk to us, but I raising a question more than anything else is, like I said, I was a pipe fitter and I spent five years in an apprenticeship. Um, that's a very skilled trade. So is meat cutting. I would say it's just as, just as skilled, if not more. And I was able to work at a shop, and it was very difficult. I may happen to have that hard work ethic that you're talking about um, that allowed me to stay there, but to hop in the line and start cutting meat with the guys who've been doing it for 20, 30 years and do it right and not screw up someone's prized elk or whatever it is, uh, it's very difficult. Are there any programs for someone who's getting out of high school for apprenticeships? Um, I know in Washington, in the Pipe Fitters Union, it's state funded um, for the apprenticeship program. My union gets a break. Um, is there anybody starting any, any programs um, that will help people get into meat cutting? And uh, this gentleman's question about here about finding good help and retaining them. <laughs> yes and no. It's, it's, it's kind of a, we're going to talk tomorrow a little bit more about this, and so I don't want to go through the whole thing right now. Um, everywhere I've been, <clears throat> it's the same issue. And from a community college perspective, you are not alone by any means in this industry. I've, I worked in this industry straight out of college for eight, nine years left, did some other stuff, um, back and careful what you wish for, but now we have a little processing area. Um, I'm right back into it again, which is which is fabulous. Um, I'll talk more about that 
tomorrow. But the reality of what, what he brought up, I think, is, is going to go there. If you go to Agri Beef up in Top of Mission, Washington Beef, they have the same issues. It does, you're not alone at a small level. And so uh, hopefully we can, I'm not the, the expert on that. There's a couple people talking with me. Uh, one of them I know is, is a lot more. I can give you the perspective from the education side and why we're having, I think, an issue with some of this. Um, but I think we're gonna cover pretty hard tomorrow. So I don't, I don't wanna be too repetitive. But you're not, you're not by yourself, and it's, it's not a doom and gloom I know, uh, from that aspect of it, but I understand exactly where you're coming from. Other challenges apart from labor that people wanna share? <coughs> I'm uh, finding, like most of you, that my customers want naturally cured products. And when I go to my inspectors, they're telling me don't touch it with it. I mean, stay away from it. Is there resources besides the internet that will tell you how to safely do it? Um, I mean, I find a lot on the internet, but you can find whatever you want on the internet. So is there a school or someone that's willing to, to put, put credible evidence out there that says do it this way and you'll be okay? Do you want to answer that? Well, Do you know something? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just a business right down the road from me here, yeah. and I was just going to tell him that we have gotten that approved. Or approved. Come on. Well, I mean, we have the same inspectors, but they tell me, unless you're going to freeze it, don't do it. I'll talk to you. We've got a, I do we got an inspection, it. USDA inspection. Do it anyway. <laughs> well, that's a, but how much liability am I taking on myself? Because I don't understand the celery powder why it's, if it's doing its job or not. And even the celery powder I buy doesn't have directions on how to use it. I'll, I'll talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not going to go into a great long detail. Yes, I mean, there's a, there's a few consultants you can hire. I know Tracy does consulting. Uh, there's a HACCP consultant there's at guy, Maine who's really right good. <laughs> um, did you want to add to that? not currently a member so I don't know if I'm allowed to speak too much but I promise you I have um, so, um, so some of the I'll, I'll, I'll contribute to the first question one of my one of my big excitements I'm gonna be a little long-winded so forgive me but one of my big excitements is the big movement back into meat being okay to eat Meat is 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 a, is a great nutritional source, and people are asking the questions: Where does it come from? We want to understand agriculture, and I think that's wonderful. And I think it's time to start telling our story, both conventional and maybe niche sites. Okay, and there's a great story, and I think this is leading us into a lot of misconceptions that are that are out there. From a scientific perspective, I was very reluctant to start accepting the celery powder cherry powder um, curing agents okay because when they first came out there wasn't a whole lot of information out there what has happened is that now we understand based off of parts per millions that can be calculated i don't have the answer today between myself and ron and dr cully we could probably figure that out for you but the celery powder is a curing agent and some of the some of the terminology that is not changed within the the definition of what is cured by USDA is that the celery powder is still acting the exact same as the nitrite and the nitrate because it contains that. That's right. It contains the same active ingredient. It's just that the perception because people can relate to the word celery. They can relate to the word cherry, which is still the active ingredient that's in sodium erythorbate and sodium acerbate, okay, that we've used in the past. I love the discussions, but that is also the big frustration. But it's not a frustration, it's an opportunity. And the dialogues are happening here. And this needs to happen. The information's out there. Um, some of, the, some of the, uh, the producers of these products can tell you the parts per million that is in it, and then we can just back calculate that. And unfortunately, your inspector their job is to not do that. Their job is to validate that you have done it. And so that's where Ron and I and, and Dr. Cully can come in and, and James 
can come in and, and if we can see what the parts per million of the nitrite content or the nitrate content may be, then we can help you with, um, with balancing that out in your formulations. Okay. Sorry for taking so long. No, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Forgot about the meat scientists. That's what you guys do. <laughs> um, I was going to kind of be quiet today, but uh, kidding. If you didn't, if, one of the things I found out um, about 15 years ago, I started on celery powder. We were doing all this stuff. We actually got it approved, and then USDA came back and said, "No, you can't do that," uh, because they didn't like the fact that we were actually following all the uh, appendix A and B rules and so on and so forth. I did find out about three months ago that. And it may fit what some of you are looking for. Newlywed Foods has a pre-digested celery powder. Still follows under all the same rules, but it gives you a better calculation. It's five, I think you're using five ounces of, of this pre-digested in a brine, and it still follows all of those same rules. It, it meets as celery cured. It, it follows all the natural curves. And as a, as a the company I work for, um, uh, was an organic company, but we decided not to go the natural route. We decided to stay with the cure because it was still the best route. And we could predetermine, we could calculate. One of the things we found out in our early studies was is that sometimes the parts per million in celery powder, because if you look at the original parts per million, it's like 2,500 parts per million in a raw product. We were finding out that our, our packages or our product actually contained as much as 200 to 250 parts per minute in the finished product. Typical finished product should only be somewhere around 30 to 50 parts per million. By addition of this new celery powder, we've been able to slow it down and we're actually getting the 30 to 50 parts per million that are affecting the cure. So check with Newlywed Foods. I know it's out there because we use it all the time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bob. Any, any other um, challenges or things that keep you awake at night that that you guys want to share with the rest of the group? No, you all sleeping really good. <laughs> I, I know there's a few spouses here that probably would say no. My husband make me pay the bills. <laughs> um, okay, I'm not a comedian, so I'll end, I'll end my stand-up routine now. Um, <laughs> so. NPAN gets a lot of calls from uh, rural development, economic development agencies, um, regional agricultural organizations, Cattlemen's Association, Farm Bureau, etc., about the supposed lack of processing, that there's just not enough, that this is some great bottleneck that we have to solve. And, uh, and NPAN has done a lot of research on that and found that often that's not exactly the case. Uh, it's often more seasonal bottlenecks, um, fall especially, whereas you know this time of the year people are hard pressed to get enough animals in to keep their plants operating and keep all their staff on. So, so it, it, it's a it's a gray area. It's, there's not there's not any obvious answer. But my question for you guys is: In your particular region, do you feel like there is a lack of uh, either slaughter or cut and wrap facilities? Um, and if so, do you have any ideas for or solutions for that? Is it a matter of you scaling up or you adding slaughter to your existing plant? or adding maybe a mobile slaughter truck or uh, a new cut and wrap place like what what would serve your region better to get more local meat processed and onto consumers plates so it's kind of a complicated question but yeah. i mean i think you're going right back to the labor issue um in that yeah i think we all would like more processors or all would like the ability to scale up. Um, I think the, the primary issues that we face are labor and regulation. And so um, I think our, some for the smaller and micro niche processors, like a lot of us are, um, it's regulation uh, on top of labor and we're, we're, we're a seasonal operation. And so you're hiring people, um, you know, you come to your county fair and you do 30% of your business of your year, 
you know, in a month. And so you try and scale up for that and then you're done, right? You're back to your normal stuff. And so trying to hire and retain people to manage through those, you know, those seasonal times, I think that's the issue you know, that we face. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, particularly for our area in Northern Idaho here, um, I think there's a, a need for more processors. Um, you know, we have a two week general rifle season for elk. And there are a lot of elk that go in the dump because there's just not enough processors to, to get them done. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is for us is I just don't feel like um, that we have uh, enough support, I think, in the area f and enough communication amongst each other sometimes to help each other out. So. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the support and that's you know that's really what MPAN is we're a network and so a lot of our processors they work with each other they help each other out and um, I haven't seen this much but you know some processors even share labor um, if their seasons uh, are opposite of each other you know if you're a pig only processor you don't have to process in the fall but cattle only operations typically do all their processing in the fall so maybe there's an opportunity to share some labor there and work with each other. Um, any other thoughts about lack of processing or need for more processing or expansion in, in your region? Well, I know I know Eastern Oregon always gets talked about. <laughs> I guess um, what I, it's part of the question. Um, uh, Montana has a state inspected program where I think it would be helpful to Oregon and Washington, Idaho, where you can keep your products in the state where it really kind of puts a kibosh on us not being able to um, wholesale products in our own states. Um, I know that the Montana situation isn't a good one right now, but um, it would be nice if there was some way where this is our slow time, this would help us in a whole, I feel like, as a whole, um, get through those times and keep things kind of rolling where we could um, distribute the products that we do make um, without having to become um, federally inspected. Yeah, so if you could wholesale within your state during the slow times and maybe make some value-added products, products that are cured or frozen that could be done any time of the year, or wholesale year round, but but just being able to have that ability opposed to not at all, where we're only we're limited to selling anything with nitrite or enhanced um, in our retail that we own, and not you know if it a different different way, different possibility. Anyone else want to chime in on this? <coughs> First of all, now, so you're custom exempt, right? Yes. But as far as being inspected, you know, we've got to fall under the same rule as being federal. I mean, I'm inspector poor, we are over there. I mean, I'll have five or, dip, five or six different inspectors a day there sometimes. It's unbelievable. But, but that's our biggest problem is falling back to these government rules and yes there is going to be some major changes over there in Montana but but you know it's it's not easy by by no means and I don't know how our state <coughs> program is going to end up here I'm I'm hoping for it I've really fought hard for our state inspection and, and, um, Speaking of inspection, um, my next question is there's a lot of custom <coughs> folks in here. Uh, what what would inspire you to become USDA inspected or what is preventing you from becoming USDA inspected? Regulation. For us, the biggest uh, challenge is the paperwork. I mean, the process that I do on a daily basis is probably the same as in an inspected plan. The only difference is, is that I have to do another three or four hours a night of paperwork for the inspection process. It's not the processes I'm doing, 
It's trying to fulfill their paperwork. And if you do your paperwork right, regardless of your process, and then somebody gets sick, it, it doesn't matter. And so paperwork is not necessarily the answer, but that's the government's tell-all on how you're processing. I mean, you guys didn't go into this to do paperwork every day? No. Come on. Three to four hours. Half your day. That sounds awesome. Well, no. <laughs> Getting back to this paperwork, sometimes you know some of these small or very small plants, they haven't got enough people working there to everybody's supposed to sign off on everybody else. Well, there's when you're a one-man show, it's illegal for you to initial three times in a row. So, what do you do? Does anyone else want to chime in on the becoming inspected or not? I think that uh, we're going to need to draw this to a close here pretty soon. It's about 3 o'clock. But I think it's an opportune time for me to share with you a federal inspector who came to my very, very small plant. And he spent, he made a, a quite a trip in this whole uh, week. I started uh, I think in Denver, Colorado and he ended up in uh, somewhere in Washington and Pasco and Hillmead. I don't know whether he, where he went but that's beside the point. But he spent five hours in my plant. I'd never want one there again. <laughs> he was a nice enough man. I, I will not bad nothing but because of that. I believe were beyond the pale and they had nothing to do with the quality of my meat my processing and what I send out to my customers and I had had enough and I said sir you've been in the military I know that and you have had lots of inspections yourself you have had uh, immunizations, you've had shots, you've been through the mill medically, probably. And, I, and he said, yes sir, that's right. He, and he always addressed me as, yes sir, that's right. And I said, have you ever had a colonoscopy? <laughs> and he said, no sir, I never have. And I said, I never have either until today. <laughs> and I thank you for not giving me another one. That was a perfect ending to this lovely discussion. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. I'll be out in the hallway doing short video clips. We'd love to talk more with you and enjoy.